Hello, Pastor Brad here. We're glad to be with you again today. Thank you for joining with us. We've had two services back together again, and it's been awesome. We've really enjoyed being able to see each other again, to worship together, to draw strength from one another. If you're not able to make it out yet, you know, we just can't wait until we can see you. If you're in the Columbus area and you don't have a church, we want to invite you to consider coming to, uh, to joining us, letting us get a chance to get to know you. You'll be welcome. We'll be glad to have you with us. If you're not from Columbus, we're certainly glad that you have chosen to be with us today. We're in John chapter 17, and uh, we can't wait to be here. We are, it is the Lord's final discourse, and uh, he's talking to his disciples. He has just finished a time of instruction to them, uh, showing them his love. This is Thursday night in the text. He's been, he's going to be betrayed. He already is. Judas has already left. Just, in, just before long, they're going to be at the Garden of Gethsemane, and Judas is going to come. They're, he's going to be portrayed. And tomorrow he'll go to the cross on Friday and, and, and give his life for the world. In that context, the last thing that he does here in this upper room or in, in process from the upper room is simply this. He lifts up his eyes and he begins to pray. Last week we saw this as he prayed, verses 1 through 5. We saw the Lord Jesus simply commune with his Father. He prayed from his own heart to the Father. Uh, he just prayed about the community he has with the Father. And, and what he shows us there is really important. He gave us the broad spectrum, really, of the purpose of, of his word in our life and the purpose of his program. Everything that has ever been revealed from the word of God. We see its purpose in the prayer of Jesus Christ. We are reminded that the purpose of, of God's word is simply this. It's the glory of God. It's to honor God. And the purpose also is this, is to, is to reveal a Savior to the world, uh, to reveal Jesus Christ, not just a Savior, not just as the Lamb of God, but ultimately as a King of kings and Lord of lords, as we see in Revelation. Verse 6, as we pick it up in John 17, <clears throat> John writes, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of this world. That could be extensive and everyone who's ever been saved, but, but initially here it's the disciples. He says, they belong to you, Father, and you have given them to me. And we see, we see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all so intricately involved in, in what salvation is all about. And here as he talks to his Father, he acknowledges the role of his Father, and he acknowledges the unity and harmony which they have and what salvation means. We're reminded as John begins in chapter 1, Jesus says, I, he's been given, no one's ever seen God. No one's ever seen God the Father, but Jesus Christ can, but he might reveal the Father to us. He might reveal Jesus. He might reveal the Father. No one's ever seen the Father. Not face to face. We can't see the Father face to face and live. You know, Jesus comes in the flesh. And he is deity before us. He is God before us. And everything that we see in Christ is in the Father. And we understand that just to see the Son is to see the Father. He says, I've manifested them to you, to you the disciples. What he highlights is the importance of relationship. Luke chapter 6, when he chose the disciples, he spent that previous evening, the whole night, in prayer. Communing with his Father, talking to his Father, praying over his disciples, the path that they would take, the their journey they would take together, his course to the cross, honor and glory to the Father, a commitment to the will of his Father, all those things. We don't know the specifics, but he, he spent the evening in prayer, and then, he, and then he chose those men. And when he chose them, and here in verse 6, as he reveals and manifests himself to them, what he's, what he's highlighting to us is, is the emphasis, the importance of a relationship. Folks, we need to have a relationship with Christ. I trust this morning you know Jesus Christ is your Savior and that you're in relationship with Him, that you're walking with Jesus Christ. That's revealed in His prayer and it's revealed in His life. Let's pick it up here, shall we? Relationship is important in two ways in His prayer, verses 9 through 16. Here's how we see relationship being so important. Number one is our relationship to God. And number two is our relationship to the world. That, those both come out in the verses that we're about to see. In verse 6, as Jesus is praying, he says, Yours they were, and you gave them to me. The first thing that is important when it comes to relationship is just this. We are organically connected to Jesus Christ. That comes out of 
in the media context, it comes out of the vine and the branches. We draw our very life from Christ, new life in Christ. We don't have life in ourselves. We draw it from the vine. We draw it from Christ. We are fruitful and productive. And what the Lord does in our life, others benefit from as, as we produce fruit. And, and the character of Christ is, is visible and manifested in our life. When we are connected to Him, people notice and people see. We are living letters, Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We are, a, we are a living letter. We are words that are alive because of Jesus Christ. Our relationship with Christ is, is alive in, in that vital relationship. It's revealed in this, verse 6. He says, Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Obedience is so important. A genuine child of God is going to be committed to Christ in obedience. Jesus says here about the disciples, how empowering is this prayer? How amazingly encouraging is this prayer to the disciples as they hear and as they listen in? As they are in, in this holy of holies and they're listening to Jesus Christ talk to their Father, He's talking about them. He's talking to them. He's praying for them. And He says here about them to His Father, they have kept your word. You know, they haven't been perfect. They have failed many times. They're going to fail here in the next day, the next 24 hours, going to fail miserably. And yet Jesus Christ affirms their commitment to His Word. He affirms their commitment to honoring Him. What a beautiful thing. You know, the Lord knows our heart. You know, David was called a man after God's own heart. David failed. He failed miserably. And yet, what was revealed in, his, in the pattern of his life ultimately was a man who desired God more than anything else. He wanted to walk with God. He notices those things in your life and mine. You know, we have good intentions and we fail. But it's when we yield that that strength comes into our life. God knows. He understands. And He's there to help us. Here He affirms them. In verse 7 and 8, as He prays, He continues and He says, Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me. And they have received them. They understand. We see the father-son connection. They understand their relationship. They, they've come to to understand that that Jesus and the Father are one. The union between the Father and the Son. We could put the Holy Spirit in here too. We talked about that last week. And here we have Jesus and the Father intricately connected. The same in essence. The same in nature. The same in deity. And they have come to believe in faith that that is true. They've had to overcome the, the sense from the Old Testament that God is one. We see in the Old Testament, we see Christ in the Old Testament, we see the Spirit of God in the Old Testament, but it's only by faith that we see ultimately that God is not just one. He is one in three persons. He is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the New Testament just, just unveils that with great clarity before us. You know, it's like, it's like uh, water. It's liquid and it's ice and it's steam. It's all water, but it has different purposes. It's like an apple. It has the flesh on the outside. It has the skin on the outside and the flesh and the seeds. And it's all the apple, but it has different purposes. And, this, and God himself is one God, only one God, but three persons having different roles, but being perfect in unity and essence and nature and perfect harmony. Verse 8, he continues as he prays. And they have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Out of this flows this reality, this reality of relationship, that Jesus Christ, He's the very Son of God. They have expressed faith in Christ already, even this evening, that He is indeed the Son of God. They believe that who He declared to be, He is. They know He is from heaven. They know He is God in the flesh. And they put their confidence in that, their faith in that. That's going to that's gonna be their strength in the days to come. They said in chapter 16, Lord, we believe. He says, do you really? He wasn't questioning their salvation belief. He was questioning their readiness to put that, that belief, that faith into action in their life, to stand on that to stand firm on that. They weren't ready yet to stand firm on that in the trial they're about to face. But they would be, and they will in the future, 
But what's clear is this. The basis for our relationship is believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Verse 9 and 10, Jesus prays, and I, I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you, Father, have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine. In relationship, we see this, Jesus praying for his disciples. That's what this whole chapter is all about, but he's praying for them. It's personal. He's praying for them, these 11, specifically for these 11 men. He knows what's about to happen, but he, he's interceding on their behalf. We have the high priestly prayer here. And this is, the, this is where that high priestly element comes into this prayer. He does pray for them. He does pray for you and I. We're going to see that later on in this chapter. And even here, he's interceding for them. They belong to him. They belong to his father. And he's going to his father on their behalf, and praying strength into their life and praying, praying that their confidence in Christ would continue. Praying for grace praying for the battle that lies ahead. In verse 10, he continues to pray, and he says, all, he says and I, I am glorified in them. That's an, that's an amazing phrase in this, in this verse. Jesus is honored in his disciples. You know, we know they're not perfect. We know that they have failed and they're going to fail. And he, yet he affirms them. He, empo he empowers them. He encourages them. He says, I'm honored in you. They have walked with the Lord for three years. They have been faithful to the task. They have grown in faith. They have affirmed their, their confidence in Jesus Christ. Yes, they're going to fail, but their relationship is certain and secure. Not only that, God's grace is at work in their life. He knows that. He has honored them in them because what He will accomplish, how He will continue to transform their lives, how he will bring their salvation to completeness in the end. He will be honored through their life. Jesus Christ will receive honor and glory for how he has transformed our lives. What God is accomplishing in our lives ultimately brings honor and glory back to him. He's some honored in their life. Yes, they're not perfect, but they perfectly have me in their life as everything that they need for life and for godliness, First Peter one, uh, 2 Peter 1 3 reminds us. Philippians reminds us that, that when God starts in the life of a believer, He's promised to finish it, to complete it, to bring it to completion. His work will not be incomplete, it will not be undone, it will not be unfinished. He will complete His work in the life of every believer. No matter how we've lived for Jesus Christ here, if we are a genuine child of God, He will complete His work of grace and transform us one day when we stand before Him. We will stand accountable before Him. We will give an account for how we've lived, but yet He will still, in love and grace, complete His work of grace in our life. Verse 11, He prays, And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I'm coming to you. He's leaving. He's going to the Father. He says, They are in the world. Our relationship to the world is another reality here. Our relationship to, to Christ, to God, is going to sustain us through this relationship. We are in this world. We are intentionally placed in this world. God has placed every one of us in a very specific place in time and history, into our very specific families, into the friendships that we have, into the relationship with employees and, and neighbors that we have, into the culture in which we live. He has planted us to use us that we might grow and be used to the Lord. Very specific. He says they are, they are in this world. They are in the world, verse 11. We are in the world, and God wants to use us here. He wants to use you here. He puts you here for a purpose. He wants to use you and I in this world. Verse 11 and 12, he continues as he prays, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me that they may be one even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me, and I have guarded them. He says we're one. We're going to come back to that later in this chapter. But what it reveals here is in our relationship to Jesus Christ, to God himself, we are kept by him. We are guarded by him. We are preserved by him. 
Jesus has done that with his disciples. He has watched over them. He has guided them to green pastures. He has led them through times of great trial and tribulation. They have been tested already. They're going to be tested again. He's been with them every step of the way. He hasn't let the evil one have his way to be victorious over them. He has protected them, watched over them. What a beautiful thing. It's not been easy. It won't be easy. But Jesus Christ is praying, Lord, keep them. Father, keep them. Watch over them. Protect them. Preserve them. You know what? We have the, we have the guarding power of God in our life. He's promised to preserve us and to keep us. He knows what we're about to face. He knows what we're going to go through. He knows the challenges. He knows we're not up to them in our own strength. Yet there He is. He's promised to be your strength. He's promised to be your grace. He's promised to give you everything that you need for the moment, for life and for godliness. He's promised that. He will keep you. He will preserve you. Never doubt that. Have confidence that God will be there to preserve your life and to sustain you. Verse 12. He prays, not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that the scripture might be fulfilled. Only Judas was lost. Not lost in the sense of losing his salvation. When he was chosen, he was chosen to be part of the twelve and yet he was always in unbelief. Here he's called the son of, of destruction or the son of perdition. He is one who is who is devoted to destruction. He is one who, who stood in unbelief. He served with Christ and served with the disciples, but he never believed in faith. He never received Jesus Christ into his heart. He never had the confidence that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, the Savior of this world. He wasn't willing to let go of his view of this world and specifically this view of Israel. He wasn't willing to let that go. He thought he, could, he thought he could make it happen in his own willpower, his own strength, his own plan. He operated apart from the plan and will of God, especially here at the end. He was driven by money. What was revealed in his heart was unbelief. In relationship, we can never be lost. One who receives Jesus Christ as Savior, that work can never be undone. We can never lose our salvation. He has secured us. That's another message. That's another time. That's another place. But the Word of God is so very clear. Once we are in Jesus Christ, we can never lose that relationship. It cannot be undone. Judas was never a child of God. Psalm 41.9 Even my close friend whom I trusted, who ate my bread, he's lifted his heel against me. A reference ultimately to Judas. And then here we have Acts 1.20 and we have Psalm 69 and 100, 109 that, from which Acts 120 is written. And another is going to take the place of Judas. And we see the prophecy of God's word being fulfilled in Judas. In verse 13, Jesus continues to pray. and He says, now I'm coming to you. And these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. In relationship to God... He is showing the disciples and teaching them your relationship is going to be so important. From it, it's going to come the joy of the Lord. You know, one of the greatest resources that we have as a believer is the joy of the Lord. Because it sustains us no matter what's going on in our life. It is knowing that He's in control. It's knowing that He loves us no matter what He's allowing us to go through. It's knowing He has whatever I need for the moment. It's knowing the promises that have been laid before me that I can count on and have confidence in for all eternity. It is the joy of that relationship. It is the joy that comes from serving others, from laying my life down before others and serving His church and serving it for the benefit of the glory of God. It is, it is the joy of being used of God to, to, to see someone come to Jesus Christ as Savior, being a soul winner in my life. It is the joy of walking with the Lord personally and seeing Him change me and conform me and use me and shape me. Jesus others and you that's a great ac acronym for the word joy it is a difference maker in our life it's a difference maker i trust you have the joy of the lord it is it comes because we are fed by his word it comes because we are putting god's word into our life and it has come alive because the word of god is alive and our relationship with christ is alive and it is the most beautiful thing 
Verse 14, as he continues, he says this. See, we read, And I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. We see relationship really in two ways here. We see a relationship to God. They're in the word, but the relationship to the world, and the world has hated them. Because we're in the word of God, the world responds to us. Because our life is marked by walking after the Lord's own heart as it's imprinted on us by His Word, then the world hates what they see. The world responds to what they see. The world, the world sees the truth that comes out of our life from the Word, and it hates that response. So we are sustained by this Word. It is power in our life, and yet at the same time it provokes the world. It doesn't call us to provoke people. We're never to be provoking. We're never to be offensive to people. But as we live the word, proclaim the word, stand on its truth in a culture who increasingly doesn't accept the teachings of God's word, it will provoke them to a response against us. That's the reality of what we face. The resistance, you know, sometimes we just take resistance from the culture so personal, even I do sometimes. And yet it's not that at all. It's a response to Christ. If I'm striving to, to honor the Lord in how I present the truth of God's Word, then it's, then it's the Word of God that is, that is prompting the response in their life. And sin brings us to the place where we hate the truth. We don't like the sin in our life to be revealed. And the world will respond in, in, in great hatred. But the world will also respond in truth and faith. And that's a beautiful thing. We are reminded in verse 14 and 16 of this reality because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Verse 16, they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. The world hates them because of the world, because of the word, and the world hates us because we're not of this world. We don't belong. The world increasingly hates Christians and will hate Christians because we don't belong here. We don't share its values. Increasingly, that's being seen with greater clarity every day. You know, there was a decision made this week by the Supreme Court that's going to have great impact on Christian colleges, universities, Christian ministries, Christian businesses, Christian people, even the church. We have now had a bigger target put on our back. There's going to be lawsuits and attacks against Christians wherever they're at. We don't share the moral values of this world. We don't share the worldview that this world has. And it's going to and it's going to be become more obvious and the greater and there's going to be a distinction a clear distinction made between a christian and a non-christian in many areas if you and i are living for jesus christ that distinction cannot be it cannot be avoided it cannot be avoided if you truly are walking after god's own heart the distinctions of christ upon your life cannot be avoided against the world the world will notice they will see you and i we must teach our kids we must teach our grandkids and grandchildren we must teach those who are being influenced by our life the necessity of loving Jesus Christ and living for Him. We must teach those who are believers and children of God the value of God's Word and the value of Christ in our life. We must, we must reveal the power of God in our life. If we don't do that, then we are just, we're nothing but confusing to the world. They'll never get what Jesus Christ has done. They'll never understand when they see us live for this world and yet proclaim Christ. With clarity, we make an impact when we live for Jesus Christ. With clarity, we will influence lives. With clarity, we will bring resistance against our testimony. We have a choice to make. We have a cost to be willing to bear. There's going to be a greater cost that I'm going to have to pay and you're going to have to pay in the days ahead. I'm sure of it. Being a Christian is going to get harder and harder. And yet opportunities are going to grow stronger and stronger. There's going to be a greater clarity, greater opportunity to show the love and grace, the transforming power of the truth of the gospel. It is the gospel. It's good news. It is good news. In every context, it is good news. Against every situation, it is good news. Never forget the power of the gospel. May it imprint itself upon your heart. Verse 15 I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. He says, we're not to be isolated from the world. He says, this is my prayer. Father, not that you take them out of the world, but you keep them, you protect them from the evil one. We're going to face it. Believers around the world are being persecuted. 
many far more greater persecution than we're facing. Their lives are at stake. Their homes are burned. Their jobs are lost. Their lives are taken because they stand for Jesus Christ. We're not facing that in America. But America is transforming. It is changing. And, and where there were Judeo-Christian values upon which this nation was built, those values by a large group are being rejected out of hand. And when those values are rejected, then Christians who stand on them will be rejected as well. It is coming, and we are here. We are on the precipice of real change in our country. God's going to give us great opportunity. Will we embrace it? Will we, will we be strong enough in our relationship with Christ to stay the course? Will we have yielded our heart so that we gain strength from Christ and power from, strength, from Christ? Verse 17, he says, here's the key. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify them. Dedicate them. Dedicate that set their lives apart. Mark their lives as ones belonging to me. Mark their life by God's word. The Jesus prays, Father, mark them. <laughs> Don't let them be like chameleons who never stand out. Mark their life. Mark their life. Show that their life is is committed to the truth of God's word, which teaches about a Savior to come, which reveals my work on the cross, which reveals a heavenly Father and a Spirit who changes us. May they be marked by the word of God, which is transformative. God, instead of them hiding, may they be out there with boldness. And may the values of God's word and the principles of God's word permeate their life what opportunity they'll have for the gospel. That's a big prayer. It is only by our, our faith in Christ that we accept the mission that says, it's not going to be easy, but your word is going to sustain. Your word is going to be truth in my life. Your word is going to imprint your values upon my heart, and on those values I will stand. My confidence in Christ, upon Christ I will stand. I will look ahead to eternity, and in the here and now, I will stand for you. May, may that be our, our prayer. The Word of God imprinted upon our life. Verse 18, Jesus prays and he says, As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Not only do we, are we in this world, we are sent, we have been given a mission, we've been given a purpose. God has intentionally placed every believer in this world. We belong here. He wants to use us here. Our mission is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're not to be isolated. We're not to be separated from the world. We're, being, we're to be engaged with the world. We're to be using opportunities in relationships to show Jesus Christ. We're to be doing that with wisdom. We're to be doing that as led by the Spirit of God. We're not, to, we're not to share the gospel and its truth with every, every person in every conversation. It's not the right time, the night, not the right way, but we're to be ready always. We're to experience the wisdom and the leading of the Spirit of God. We're to be ready with the Word of God. We're to be ready with confidence in Christ. And when that moment comes, then we're to embrace it and we're to take it. He has sent us in this world. That's His purpose in our life. And in verse 19, He finishes up. In this section as he's praying for the disciples and he says father he says for their sake I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth he says I've sanctified myself that they might be sanctified he says in verse 17 sanctify them your word is truth right sanctify them in the truth your word is truth that's the same word three used it three different times he says set them apart Set them apart to be used of God. Set them apart to do God's will. Jesus says, I have, I have sanctified myself. I have consecrated myself. When we, when we set our, ourselves apart, we set ourselves to be, to be made whole by Jesus Christ. And we come to him in faith and salvation. We are set apart. We are set apart from sin and we are made whole by Jesus Christ. And he washes us and he cleanses us. And he makes us, uh, he makes us a vessel that is fit for his use. He, he brings us into relationship when the Lord Jesus Christ sanctified himself, he didn't sanctify himself from sin. He is sinless and pure from the foundation of the world. 
what he did was he, he committed himself to a path, to a purpose. That is the will of God in his life. He sanctified himself by, by committing himself to the, to the will of his Father. So that through his work on the cross, he would, he would provide the means, the power, the resurrection as the basis for our ministry, as our, for the basis for our hope as the basis for truth that we will proclaim in our witness and our testimony. Chapter, you know, verse 17, it is the word of God. If we're going to be set apart to God in victory, it's the word of God that's going to do that. It is the power in our sanctification. It is the power in how we are set apart. As we read the word of God, we, we learn the heart of God. We embrace his heart into our own. We are conformed to God's heart. We are conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And because that's true, we're changed. When we read the Word of God with open hearts, we are saying to we are saying to God, God change me, God change me so that I so that my life looks like what I'm reading on the pages of Scripture. God change me so that the world sees this testimony in my life. That's what I'm saying when I honestly open my heart to His Word. First Thessalonians four four one reminds us that when sanctification takes place, when I am when I am committed to being like Christ and living for the Lord, my goal is this, is to, is to honor Him in everything. Well, that's what we've talked about out of this prayer. That in, that in our walk, we would please the Lord. And then the most important thing is this, just the life of Jesus Christ. On the pages of this prayer and in this chapter, and we see here in Hebrews 10, when Christ came into the world, He said, Behold, I have come to do your will. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Jesus says to every believer, and he says to the disciples, he modeled it by his own life. Here's the number one mark that you are set apart to God. It is this, that you are committed to the will of God, that you're committed to doing the will of God in your life, that you are committed to honoring God and pleasing him by saying, God, what would you have me to do? I'm willing to do that. God, give me wisdom to know your path, to know the choices I should make today, to know the attitudes that I should have in my heart today as I face whatever I'm going to face. God, it's your will that I want in, these, in, in everything. God, would you lay before my heart your word. May the Spirit of God bring it alive into my life. Would you give me the grace and would you extend mercy into my life to help me so that my greatest purpose, my highest purpose is to do your will to honor you in all things. Lord, we just pray that that would be the prayer of our life. That was the Lord's prayer. He was committed to the will of his Father. He never deviated from that. He went to the cross because of the joy that was set for, before him. The joy was not only in the securing of salvation for me, for us who are listening and for the world, but the joy was the, the fulfillment and completion of a path that was finishing the will of God. Lord Jesus, thank you for, for that strength and that grace. Thank you for that, that power and enablement is now ours. Lord, by your grace, extend victory into our life every day. The confidence that stands on you, because as you are able, we are able as well. Lord, help us. The will of God in relationship to you, that that may be our testimony. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming. Thanks for listening, being with us. We invite you to come back next Sunday. We'll continue our time together in John 17.